Welcome back to another episode of the Burn Factory Podcast. What is up, guys? Welcome back to another episode of the Burn Factory Podcast. As you may know, I'm your host, Priest, joined by my co-host, my brother, Mr. Phoenix. Say what's up to the camera. What's up, y'all? This is called the Burn Factory for a reason. I was literally, literally caught on fire. 50% chance to live, but through that, started this podcast because I believe Every person out there has a burn moment somewhere in their life that got them to where they are at today. Yes, you heard priests say a burn moment. So a burn moment is a super hard time in someone's life that they had to fight and to get through to be where they are today. And me and priests believe that every single person go through these little burn moments every single day. So on this podcast, we are here to discover that within our guests. But today, Priest, we have an amazing guest today. He was born in a boxing family with his father and two brothers fighting and our trainers himself. They have won mul- he has won multiple national championships as an amateur. He belongs to a legendary group as he has won four championships in four different weight divisions in which only two other men have done so. He is a true legend of the sport, and most of all, he is a man that strives to give back to his community that he loves. So please give a warm welcome to Mikey Garcia. Yeah, thank you guys. Thank you. Appreciate welcome, it. champ. Welcome, welcome. Welcome. I thank saw you. I saw on your Instagram story a couple, uh, a couple of days ago of you tasing some of your buddies. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta tell me what is it? What is it like to be tased? Uh, we we were just having fun, you know. Um, a friend of mine, a buddy of mine. Had a uh, tase gun. He's a security guard, and he he uh, left it at home. <laughs> so we we're just messing around with it. I had actually been tased uh, when I was in the uh, police academy years ago, and just to you know be part of the of the uh, academy, and and in one of the requirements is to get pepper spray, get tased, things like that. And uh, so I just brought it out, and we we're just playing around. And some of the guys were like, "Hey, let's 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 see what it's about." So I you know give a little little, little stun, a little little. <laughs> shot there but nothing nothing crazy nothing, nothing serious major. just just for fun i gotta get one so i can taste <laughs> phoenix <laughs> i know there's there's so many times that i would just love to pull out a taser and just be like <laughs> yeah shut up like <laughs> why me you always talk trash on me so i'm gonna have to give you a nice little zzz, mm, right and you won't be talking no more trash but yeah, so I was looking at it and I was like, man, that's like a real taste gun. It's not just like a little no, taste that you buy. Like it's, it's, it's like it's a legit gun. Uh, like I said, he's a security guard, okay. um, and he has a, a real, real taste gun. And um, so he he was at my house. He left it out there, and um, so I just you know I grabbed it and I had already um, talked to him about it before. You know, we were playing with it, or whatever. So I knew it's it's not lethal. It's not anything bad like that, um, unless you put it in and actually use it on certain body parts, like by the neck, that I could really knock someone out. But, you know, we're putting it on, on people's hips and, and, and legs, and it's not a big deal. It will shock them enough to, like, feel, like, like a sensation throughout their body, and it does take them down. But it doesn't do anything, like, major damage or anything like that. Oh, that it was just fun. It was that's fun. scary. Did you get tased? I didn't see any of the videos. Did you, did you nah, get tased? Nah, you just nah, tased nah, 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 nah. He's, like, he's like, I'm the one tasing <laughs> people. <laughs> I'm the one holding the gun. Yeah. yeah Have like you said, been tased? I, I did it for the academy. Um, but uh, that was uh, many, many years ago. And I don't want to do, do it again. That time, they actually sent out the uh, prongs. They actually shot you with it. And so those actually penetrate your skin. And you feel the like a shockwave throughout your whole body just paralyzes you. So that's that's a different type of, of uh, feeling than what I did the other mm-hmm. night with the guys. That was just a different different thing, just lighter. So you said the academy. Were you trying to be a police officer at one point? I, I did do the uh, police academy. I was thinking maybe going to law enforcement. This was before my boxing career took off. Mm-hmm. Um, it was back in 2010. So okay, But you were a pro at that point, right? I was a pro. Yeah. I was a pro. I had a few uh, fights already as a pro. Um, I was, I was already like a four year pro. My career was not developed as well just yet. So I, I was thinking maybe, you know, having something to do with law enforcement, just in case boxing didn't do anything else for me, I could have something to fall back on. For Mm -hmm. sure. For sure. For sure. Uh, did, did you, did you want to do boxing because of your dad did it or your brothers? Um, so if I take it back. You know, you mentioned growing up in a boxing family. My older brothers were boxers. My dad was a trainer. So I grew up watching boxing my whole life, ever since I was a little kid. The conversations around a dinner table were always boxing related. 
you know, we watch all the fights on, on pay-per-view back in the day, the De La Hoya, the Chavez, Tyson, those those big names, you know. I didn't think I would be a fight. I never imagined myself being a, a, a professional boxer. I saw my brother's box. I just figured that's kind of like for them. I grew up in it, but I, I, it wasn't something that I dream of doing myself. So I, I did, you know, go to school and whatever. And I went to college, two-year college there, community college. Then I did the police academy. I wasn't sure what I wanted to do as far as a career yet. So I wanted to have options. But um, being there here in boxing, you kind of play with it here and there. And at 14, I was doing some amateur fights. Then at 18, I turned pro. But again, just with the thought of let's see where it goes. Not 100% dedicated to, to boxing being my only option. I wanted to have options. So... We started boxing at you know at a young age of 14, but um, it just wasn't like a dream. Like I knew this is what I was gonna do, and this is where I'm gonna make it. It, it was never like that, at least not for me. Um, at 18, I turned pro, and you know we just develop a career just to see what happens. I did well. I started you know moving on, winning fights, and eventually, the big breakthrough was 2011. 2011, I was already maybe like 20 fights in or 22 fights somewhere in there. I got an opportunity to fight on an HBO uh, fight card. I was a co-headliner for for a fight in Atlantic City. Um, so it's like a big opportunity for me. Get, you know, a lot of eyes on you now and make some better money. And it's like, okay. So we took that fight. We win the fight. Make me look really, really good. The opponent was a, a good opponent, undefeated opponent. Opponent, he was at the moment NABF NABO champion, which is a North American uh, championships. He had two of them, and I beat him. I took the titles away from him, and they ranked me like I think it was like number six or number five in the world. So now it's like okay, now there's some serious opportunities here for me, you know, opening up. So that's really where where my boxing career really st- started to. Take forward, and like I said, that's 2011. I did the academy the year before that, mm-hmm. right in 2010. So it was just like the timing was just there. So that's that's how it started. And after that, I mean, just you know, kept winning fights, and eventually, you know, all the title fights and everything else that I, that I accomplished. But that's that's really how it started. Yeah. Even even before that, actually, in 2004, you did win gold at the Junior Golden Gloves. Oh yeah. yeah. Well, so. as as an amateur, when we started, in fact, when I started my amateur career at 14. Um, it was because a nephew of mine had started boxing. He had started boxing. We went to support one of his fights, and there was a kid there that didn't have an opponent, and my brother just signed me up to <laughs> jump in there. But because I was not licensed to be a, a, an amateur fighter, I I had to do what they said an exhibition, just an exhibition. Yeah. So I did it, and it was kind of natural to me. It kind of felt natural, like, you know, the competition. I liked it. It was, it was interesting that I decided to con- continue training and actually – get my license to compete as an amateur. Um, and I'm talking back like in 2001, 2002 when that started. Then in 2004, I won some tournaments and eventually, you know, built a good amateur career to where I could see some, you know, opportunities to turn pro. And then we did turn pro, like I said, in 2006. Yeah. That kind of could have been like your burn moment that if your your nephew never signed you up, then you I probably would never have been be here. here. Yeah. I, I, I That's might crazy. not have, have been able to do it. Not that I, like I said, I never dreamed of being a fighter, but it just so happened that that day, one kid didn't have an opponent. My brother signed me up and put me in there. And then after that, that's when I decided to continue training and, and actually go to the gym and actually, you know, try to compete. Prior to that, we I never went to the gym to train. I would go just to watch my brother and some of the other guys train and, and we would go to the fights and that's it. But I never actually took it like, as a sport for me to do and practice. That's that's so crazy. Just if he doesn't sign that, you're not yeah. fighting. Yeah. But that's actually leading us yeah. right into the beginning. So on this podcast, we do use the word burn, and each letter is an acronym. So B is beginning. Take us to the beginning. Were there any burn moments well, that happened? I mean, growing up, like I said, we grew up in a boxing family. Um, all the conversations were always boxing-related. My oldest brother, Danny, he boxed professionally. I think like 24 professional fights, retired, didn't have a, a, a great career, but he was the one to kind of introduce it. Um, my dad was the trainer, and 
Then my brother Robert was was uh, fighting. He became world champion, champion back in yeah. '98. Yeah. So I remember my brother's career. Um, there was times where you know we I was probably like 10 years old at the moment or whatever, 10, 12 years old. We would go to the fights and hang out, and you know we experienced some defeats with my brother. He he lost uh, on three different occasions. Um, he got stopped those three times, but two of them were like really really like pretty bad knocked out, knock, knock, getting knocked down and getting knocked out. And so those were sad moments for the family because we had not experienced losses like that. Um, so it, it also taught us in a way, you know, you, you got to take, you know, your defeats just the way you do your victories. You got to keep moving forward and, and never quit, you know, and don't just give up. So, you know, we saw his career unfold. Um, I guess maybe some of that taught me as well, you know, as an amateur, I lost 12 fights as an amateur. I had 60 amateur fights total, uh, 48 and 12, 40 and 14. So I forget the exact numbers, but I mean, I, I took the losses and moved on forward, you know, kept kept it going. Uh, didn't really affect me as much as people might think it, it, it would. Um, you gotta learn to just, you know, keep moving forward and and keep your eyes on, 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 on your future goals, not, you know, give up and do all so much on on a loss or on a challenge that, that you're facing at the moment, you gotta keep going. So that's that's kind of like what it taught me, you know, growing up, seeing those losses with some of the other fighters that my dad was training, you know, we keep 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 it going. Mm -hmm. You mentioned your amateur career and you had 60 fights and nowadays people have 200, 300, 400 amateur fights. Oh yeah. So do you think, was it a good or like kind of like a bad thing that you had not as many amateur um, fights as soon as you like you turned pro? Even even when I, when I did it, I'm. I was one of the, the fighters, one of the kids that had the least amount of fights. A lot of other fighters had a lot of fights, you know, 100 and some, 200 fights. I started my career, like I said, a little later at 14 versus others that started at 8, 10 years old. I started at 14, and at 18, I was already turning pro, right? So it was only a four-year amateur career. Most kids that, you know, start a lot earlier have a lot of fights. They go through a lot of tournaments. So they're fighting, you know, you know, a lot of, uh, I don't know, maybe four times a, a week sometimes in the tournament. I didn't have that. But just growing up in boxing, I kind of gained experience just from watching and the proper training and everything. So it allowed me to still have a good amateur career. I still had some really good fights. I was national champion, like you mentioned, in 04 for the Golden Gloves, but then I was also national champion in 05 for the police activities league, the PAL tournament. It was a national tournament. Um, so I still was able to compete at a high level of amateur. I didn't make it to go to the Olympics. The, the Olympic uh, round for me would have been 2008, but I turned pro in 06. Okay. So I, I, didn't, I didn't get to compete for the Olympics. I decided to turn pro, I was 18. I didn't want to wait two more years in the, in the amateur ranking system and tournaments. I said, nah, let's just go pro. That's where I'm gonna make my, my, my career anyways, or at least that's where I would want to have a successful career. The amateurs is enough to learn and move on. Yeah. So that's, that's kind of why, why I decided to just turn pro. Is it a long process turning pro? Uh, no, you guys can, if you guys want to go pro, you guys <laughs> can probably go pro yourselves. Really? It's not, it's not that difficult to turn pro. It's not like other sports, like, NBA or, or other sports that are like really, really like you got to be the best of the best of the best, right? In boxing, it's not quite like that. You um, you apply for your license with the athletic state state athletic commission. You got to have physical exams performed by certain doctors to know that you're healthy to to compete, um, and some knowledge of boxing experience, whether it's amateurs or just enough training with the right teams with the right trainers they'll, they'll they'll give you your license they'll grant you your license where they do um pay more attention is the level of opponents that you're going to be facing based on your level of, of experience so if you're barely turning pro that's why you see a lot of guys that are turning pro or, or a few you know four or five six fights still fighting guys that are completely like overmatched yeah but it's because the, there's still only you know four professional fights in you know the, the level is not quite the same so they're they're able to fight guys like that if you were to have say 15 16 18 fights you're no longer going to be able to fight just anybody they're going to match you up 
or at least the commission will approve certain fights that are a little bit even matched. So it, it, that's where they pay more attention. But yeah, you guys can even turn pro yourselves. That's I so can have, crazy I, to me. I can have you guys on my next show. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. Garcia. I do Garcia promotions, promotions yeah, which is had one, uh, in January. We had a show on January the 28th. I think we might be doing another one in April. We might be doing it in San Antonio. Okay. But uh, if you guys one day want to turn pro, we could definitely do that too. Uh oh, shoot, <laughs> shoot! I weigh um, like I weigh like sixty pounds heavier than you. You think they would sanction it? Uh, uh, our fight? You guys would have to fight individual fights, separate individual. Separate uh, fights. I mean, uh, yeah, the weight difference would be too. Yeah, too, too, too much. Too if too they give me headgear, I'm in. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not taking blows to my bare head, but give me headgear and eighteen ounce gloves, and we'll, we'll do it. We could do. We could do. We could do amateur fight. Yeah. Amateur fight with yeah. the bigger gloves, head gear. Head gear. We guys, we guys can do that one. Okay. Uh oh. I might, I might think about. It. I might <laughs> need you to train. Yeah. You might, you might have to fun. train us. I need, I yeah, need a, sure. I need a full twelve week camp with, with uh, you. That's, 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 oh that's, my that's gosh! Fine. And then you gotta go into like diet, and I don't even have a good diet to begin with. <laughs> and you gotta go to weight cut, and I don't even think I can cut weight because I'm so skinny. <laughs> we'll, make, we'll make it easy for you guys. You guys can fight at a comfortable weight. Oh, comfortable yeah, weight. Comfortable. Comfortable weight. Okay. So you, you will lose a little bit of weight just to get in shape. But you yeah. don't have to, you know, starve yourself, you know, to to really cut weight, like you know, like like a major fight does. Uh, Dang, no more weight, sucks, no more Chick Fil A, no more Chick Fil A, <laughs> no that's more for Chick. Sure. Oh my gosh, uh, that's I'm not a fighter. I remember so growing up, my dad's an Olympic athlete. He did judo, mm -hmm. so I did judo too. And I remember I'd have to like cut like one or like two pounds, and like at that age, like you're cutting from like. 80 to like 78 yeah, like yeah, yeah. i just remember it like cutting sucked and then i'd get to football and i was always like a bigger kid growing up and i was like 10 or 11 and i was playing football with 14 15 year olds and i'd still have to cut yeah, weight like wow. yeah so cutting weight's not not the funnest of things it's, for it's, sure it's one of the things that from my understanding no fighter likes to do i mean that's the one thing all fighters hate is cutting weight we do it. You know you have to do it. Um, and even though you have a good diet throughout your training camp and you're losing weight automatically just from working out and eating well, you lose weight. But then that week of the fight, some fighters are still 14, 16 pounds over. Um, some I've heard of even more drastic uh, weight cuts that I've, I've, I've heard of fighters um, do. I never had that big of a weight cut. For me, it was always six, eight pounds max. But no matter how much you have to cut, it's never you know pleasant. It's always, it's always yeah. ugly, and and you feel you know sick, and you sometimes do get sick. I you know I've experienced it myself. So the way the cut, cutting with the weight is is probably the least you know enjoyable moment yeah. of a fighter's career. So that week. Obviously, don't do like water overload, right? Like you're drinking gallons of water. Yeah, and then it's it's changed. See, the, the strategies and the methods that we use for, for cutting weight now are very different than what my brother did back in the day in, in his career and even further back. It, it's, it's actually changed a lot to where it's a little healthier now by drinking a lot of water and maybe cutting the portions of food and the amount of food intake um, versus back in the day with my brother – they used to stop drinking. They they wouldn't drink water for like those three, four, five days. Oh man! You know, and it just it's it's punishing to to the body. It's it takes a toll. But that's the thought process back then. That's what everybody was doing. That's the 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 process that every fighter would would do to cut weight. Now with obviously new new uh, training techniques and better. Um, education you know in in the sport and about losing weight and everything you've learned to do it in uh, what i would say maybe a healthier way Even yeah. though it's not healthy but the healthiest that you can possibly do it you're drinking a lot of water and and then that you know 24 hour before the the actual weigh-in you cut the water and then you burn it all off and i mean it's a little bit better mm -hmm. but it's still you know draining and tiring and it's you you feel like you're about to die. Yeah. Oh. You feel sick. How how do like how's like the sleeping? Because I feel like if you're going to bed like super dehydrated and like tired, like do you even sleep well at all? I'll, I'll tell you like the one day before. Story, I'll tell you one story. See, like I said, most of the times I, I didn't have a, a big you know weight cut. It was six eight pounds. It was it was fine. Six to eight pounds, not a big deal. Lose that and you're still pretty comfortable. But I'll tell you about one one story. One time back in 2013, I was supposed to defend my featherweight title. I was trying to cut weight that week 
And this is before we did the whole water, you know, this is still old school method. We stopped drinking water and we were working out for like three, four days prior to the, the weigh-in and my body shut down. I couldn't lose any more weight. I kept trying. I did get sick from, from doing so to the point where I couldn't sleep that night before. I didn't sleep a single minute of, of the night. Um, my body was in pain, like literally in pain. My whole body was in pain. Uh, I, I would toss and turn around bed trying to like get comfortable. I couldn't. I would grab the remote to try to watch some TV and see if that would help. And I realized that I couldn't let go of the remote. My body was cramping up so much that I couldn't open, I couldn't extend my fingers to let go of that remote. I would have to pry them with my other hand. That's how bad it got. So I know some of these fighters go through that every single time. I went through that that one time and I just, I, I wasn't able to even make weight. I was about almost two pounds over. I, I, there was nothing else I could do. When people sometimes say, oh, he didn't even try. Dude, you didn't know what I went through to try and actually make weight. You know, I, you passed out, you, know, you faint, you wake up and you're on the floor and like, oh, what, what, what happened, you know? So those are moments that I think a lot of fighters go through, but we just don't share them or we don't share them enough. Um, it, it was horrible. So I know that when I see some of these fighters and they're all ripped, I think they're probably at their weakest moments right, right there. At that scale, even though they looked all ripped and muscular and everything, they're at their probably weakest of the entire camp. The next day after they rehydrate, they're back to normal. It's crazy the way the body can, can do that. But that's, that's, that's part of you know, being a fighter. Did you fight? Did you fight that next I day? I fought that next day, yeah. Wow. Um, in Did fact, you win? We had a, we, I, I won. We had a doctor come in and uh, check you know, my, my, my health because I couldn't make weight. I was throwing up. Um, on the way back to the room after the weigh-in, I, I passed out again. They were holding me. So we called the doctor, and the doctor advised not to fight. He's like, you can't fight. You got to come into the doctor. You got to come to the hospital. You got to hydrate, you know, you, this and that. And I said, no, I can't. I'm fighting tomorrow. And they're like, dude, we, we need you at the hospital. They're like, I can't. I'm like, I don't want that. I need you to do whatever you can right now just to get me, you know, ready for, for tomorrow. Um, so he did. He, you know, tried to help out. I, I lost. I was, I was seeing blurry throughout the whole time. From all the dehydration and everything, my eyesight was not not well. I was I would see like double vision, like blurriness. I couldn't hear. I had that ringing the whole time. Next morning, my eyesight was normal, but I still had that ringing um, after breakfast and you know resting a couple hours. Then my hearing came back and it, you know it, it kind of felt normal. So I told my 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 brother, my dad, and and the manager at the time. No, I, I think I'll, I'll go ahead and, and, and go through the fight. I, th I, think, I think we're good. So we went in, into the locker room, warming up. You know, I felt fine. We got into the, in, into the actual fight. I dropped my opponent in the second round, and then I stopped him in the fourth. So it was a short fight to where the general audience, the general person, never knew that I was sick, how bad I was that night before and that day before. Um, if you want to catch any of that, that's actually on, on YouTube. They had a, a building up thing. Uh, HBO had a, a segment called, uh, it was named uh, Two Days. I think it was called Two Days with Mikey Garcia. They, they did a segment of that with, with different fighters. Okay. It happened that they actually caught a lot of that. Really? Wow. But it was released after the fight, like a whole month oh. after or whatever. And that's when See. people realized, like, damn, like, he actually went through all that before the fight. Like, you couldn't tell because I won early. Who knows, if the fight had extended to like the 8th, 10th round or whatever, maybe I wouldn't have been able to do so. Maybe I would have been so beat up and tired that I would, you know, be knocked out or something. Those are the risks that, that you're taking. Whenever you're warming up in the back, was there a burn moment saying like, like a bad burn moment and a good burn moment saying like, you know what, maybe I shouldn't fight, like I'm sick or I got to go out there, I need to go put this guy away. Was there a burn moment? It, I, for me, it actually happened um, the night before trying to cut weight and we're in the tub, hot water, trying to, you know, lose some weight. And then as I got up to check the scale or whatever, I don't remember passing out. I just remember waking up. I'm on the floor. 
and my dad's at my feet and he's I could see the 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 worriness in his in his face and his expression. He's he's scared. And that's where it, it, it kind of hit me like should I still be doing this? Like this is dangerous. Like waking up and you're on the floor and you look around and you're in the bathroom on the on the floor and I mean that was scary. My dad was scared. So the thought did you know it, it did come to mind like should I should I even go through this? Should I even try or should I just let them know exactly what's going on. Like, I can't. Like, I'm, I'm done. But at the same time, I tried to um, com- comfort my dad. I'm like, no, don't worry. It's fine. I just kind of got a little dizzy. I'm okay. I'll be fine. I just got a little tired. I'm tired. But I had completely no knowledge of what had, had just happened. I completely passed out. As I got up, I just blacked out. And um, during the, the, the warm-up, some of that came back, like, are you sure that you want to just go in and then go in the fight? I mean, you're putting your life on the line at that moment. At that, you know, at that point, you're really putting your life on the line. You're going to go in there. You're expected to fight. My opponent had a record of, like, 33 wins, two losses, 30 knockouts. Like, he was a serious opponent, right? Former world champion, two divisions. Like, it's, it's not an easy fight. And... I'm not in the 100% best shape, so it, it it does cross your mind. My dad was there, and, and he was, you know, trying to talk to me, and I, I kind of tried to actually comfort him more. I'm like, don't worry. It's going to be fine. He's going to come at me thinking it's going to be easy for him because he saw me at the weigh-in struggling and all this. So he's going to come in, which is going to help me even more. He's going he's gonna to come in, and, and I'm just going to catch him. It's going to be easier for me. It's not going to be difficult. And it kind of helped out that it did work out fairly short four four rounds i was able to drop them and stop them and you know night was over we won we go home happy <laughs> oh wow <laughs> that's so interesting great because, bear moment. yeah okay. that is a burn moment but like just the whole weight cut thing in general like um i don't know if you know but there's this thing called one fc it's an mma um uh-huh. it's over in singapore and they've completely outlawed weight cut really yeah so they so you have to take like hydration tests you have to do all kinds of stuff so it's kind of starting to make people fight at a more natural weight, like you, like you talk yeah. about, like when you're training and you're in camp, you're eating better, you're going to lose weight, but like getting rid of like completely depleting yourself. So do you think like for you as a fighter, how diminishing is like weight cutting for you on fight night? Look, um, we all do it or I, I did it. Um, the reason why we do it is not to try to have an advantage over our, our opponent. Like a lot of people think, oh, you're, you're, you're a weight bully, you know, you're so big, why are you fighting smaller weight class or whatever? It's not, that's not really how it works. See, if if we're both training and, and we're losing natural weight from eating well, um, if we were to fight each other at that moment, fine, that'd be a fair fight. But if you're at a weight class, for example, at 140 pounds, 135 pounds, lightweight, right? If I'm fighting at lightweight, and I'm walking around 155, so 20 pounds over. You're walking around. Naturally, as you're training, you're going to start losing weight. You're going to lose about 10 pounds naturally just from losing water and and fat and training and eating well. Your weight cut might be those 10 extra pounds, right? If my other opponent was doing the same thing, that's fine. We would be facing each other. We're both equal. However, if I was fighting at 135 correct i'm trying to make 135 and i'm trying to fight at my comfortable weight of 145 right that guy at 145 in 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 the fight game is not walking around 145 ever he's coming up coming down from like 170 yeah so he's gonna be come cutting down to 145 but by fight night i'll still be maybe 150 he's gonna be 165 you know, and something like that is is not healthy. Yeah. So in order for for the fighters to you know fight on an even playing field, everybody cuts weight because you know that the next day you're also gonna hydrate. Both of you guys are gonna hydrate pretty similar. You know, there might be a few pounds difference. You know, sometimes most for the most part, it's it's only a four or five pound difference. Still difference, but not huge. Some of these other guys do rehydrate a lot more, and then you see the big difference, you know, 8, 10 pound difference. That's that's dangerous. That's scary. But overall, everybody's within, you know, four, five, six pounds max. So it's not a big deal. 
in boxing, I know that recently, for the last few years, um, there's been some organizations that have also tried to kind of help the, the problem, if it's a problem. I know the WBC controls a little bit about about the weight. They'll ask the fighters throughout training camp to show the proof of what they're, where they're at, how much weight they're losing, and and keep a, a, a modest uh, consideration on, on, on their weight. If there's too much weight leading right before the fight, um, they might actually cancel the fight because they don't want you to be cutting so much weight, you know, within a short amount of time. So they, they're starting to consider that more. Um, but, I mean, I, from what I've seen and in my experience, my own experience, you know, if you do it moderately, it's not, it's not such a bad uh, practice. Um, but if you were to lose 16, 18 pounds in the last two, three days, that could be dangerous because your body's so depleted of nutrients. You know, it's not just water. It's just your, your whole body's, you know, depleting, depleted of nutrients and you're fatigued, you're tired. You may not recover. You may not hydrate enough. Even if you gain so much water weight, you may not be fully hydrated well to compete and perform. That's where it can be dangerous. If, if, if you lack fluid in, in the brain, you know, the punches are going to knock you out. You can go in, in a concussion. You can go in a coma. You, you can lose your life. That's yeah. where it's dangerous. That reminds me of the Dominican Republic guy who actually got knocked got knocked down. I yeah. I think his name is Pincard Pincardo. Richard Richard P- Ri- Richard Richard. Richard yeah. yeah, Richard. Um, same thing happened. He got, went into a fight, got Richard, knocked. Richard down. Richard Colon. Is, that's a oh, gosh, I don't even know how to pronounce <laughs> that name. <laughs> um, but yeah, he got knocked down a couple times and got back up. And like in the in the ring, he went into a coma, woke up, went back, and just. Yeah, he, his life completely changed. Um, he got hit in the back of the head a few times. The referee allowed it to continue. I mean, they, they might have taken a point away from the opponent or whatever, but they didn't put an end to it. And sure, after the fight, right there, he just kind of collapsed. They rushed him to the hospital, and it was from the punch to the head, you know, mm-hmm. and then and he, he ended up uh, going to a coma, and he's he's still not fully recovered. He's... You know, his life changed completely. He's he's almost like in a vegetable state. Yeah. It's very, very sad. So sad. And that happens also, that could happen when someone is super dehydrated, super tired, fatigued, and, you know, the, the lack of fluid and water in, in the body and the brain could easily, you know, do those those same, you know, results. And fighting can be so scary at the end of the day, just off of a weight cut. This portion of the Burn Factory podcast is sponsored by Phoenix Salon Suites. Please visit Phoenix Salon Suites at P-H-E-N-I-X Salons, S-A-L-O-N, Suites, S-U-I-T-E-S dot com to find one near you. It's time to go to you and Burn. Unfortunate, unfortunate things happen in life. Like myself, whenever I was in sixth grade, I was severely burned. And the science experiment by my teacher that went horribly wrong and left me permanently scarred for the rest of my life. And, I mean, ever since that day, I've never been the same. And, I mean, it could be a good thing or it could be a bad thing. But, I mean, I'm sure you, as a fighter, have gone through so many unfortunate things that happen. And well, are there any burn moments? We, we um... Overall, I, I can say I was fortunate to have a pretty pleasant career, although there are some moments where you got to jump over some hurdles and some obstacles. Maybe not as as uh, bad as other fighters or as other, you know, person in, in, in life in general, but everybody encounters moments like that. Um, in my career, in, in, in boxing, my career, um, there's moments, injuries uh, happen all the time. But then you have some injuries that are, you know, a little more threatening than others and others that will actually set you back further. And and then you go into other problems with the business, the boxing. So hand injury, you know, broken thumb, broken nose, that's pretty common in, in a fight game. And although it sets you back a few months or whatever, eventually you come back. Um, one of my biggest struggles or, or, or moments like that was actually – related to the business bo- part of boxing, the, re- the the business behind it, right? So I entered this dispute with my promoter at the time. Stop rank, right? And we just couldn't agree on, on certain terms. That kept me away for two and a half years. But when it started, 
there was no finish line. There was no end, you know, finish line time frame where oh, I just got to get through it for these next few months or for this next year, and then eventually I'll get I'll get over. It, it was just like and like you're like in limbo. Like you have no idea what's going on. You don't know how far you know how long this is gonna take. Um, all meanwhile, you still got your family. I still got my kids. I got you know payments. I got mortgages. I got attorney fees. I got all this. So eventually, you start to see the like you're in trouble. You don't have money. You're running out of money. You're still you still gotta like I said pay all these bills and you guys still gotta pay uh, attorney fees and mortgages and car payments. I gotta feed the kids. There was moments where it was really really stressful, where I was wondering whether this was worth it or not or what am I gonna do. So those moments really really put things into perspective. You know, before that everything was you know, lollipops and candy and everything's chilling, mm -hmm. everything's cool, everything, everything's going well. But then it could also be taken away so fast, right? And it was through business that it was taken away. It was through through the lawsuit and everything that we had. But it also kind of reminded me, like, just as it was taken away dur during those two, two and a half years, my career could also end with, you know, a broken hand or a car accident or you just never know. So, it, like I said, it really puts things in, in, in perspective. It really puts things in, in – you got to see things through a different, you know, point of view. You got to kind of get out of the box, you know, view from the outside the box. And it was it was scary. It was daunting at times. I was running out of money. There was a few times that I was literally, without lying, down to about $300 in cash. And I was already two-time world champion. I was fighting on HBO. I was supposed to be, like, this big new thing – on the rise and expected to fight big major fights. And here I am with like literally 300 bucks in my pocket. You know, I, I took that and go to the grocery store and buy some groceries so I could have at least some food for the kids for, for the, at least for the next week or week and a half until something else, you know, came by. And, and then I could, you know, maybe make another thousand bucks or $2,000 or whatever and do something else with it. And so for a few months, it was like that during that, that period. Um, but it also, at the time, it also taught me to, like I said, you know, um, value things differently and value, you know, moments and family and friends over materials, over the cars, over, you know, things that sometimes we're valuing more than we should. So those moments there during that period did change the way I, I, I look at, you know, not only the sport, but also life and family and friends and where you really want to value and who you want to spend time with and what's really worth, you know, in, in, in the, the type of type of importance that you give something. So th that's some, th something that, that I can say changed my, my outlook on, on, on life. At first it was maybe the worst part of my life, the worst part of my career. But now looking back, it taught me to be, you know, who I am now. It's a burn moment, and that's dispute. Yeah, yeah. Um, who was it? What was the dispute like over? Uh, it started. It really was contractual um, understanding, contractual um, dispute. Um, my my understanding and my interpretation, based on what's on contract, what's on paper, black and white. My contract expired February of twenty fourteen. I had just fought in January 2014, title defense. My contract's expired next month. Let's renegotiate. Let's move on. Let's keep it going. Their understanding was that there was an extension that could apply to the, to the contract, extending the contract with its own same terms. I, I asked them to explain to me what extension that was and why does that apply? And they never gave me a straight answer. They could never pinpoint exact details why the contract had those extensions. Um, so then I was like, well, if, if, we, if we had the exact same contract, why is that you're out asking me to take the next fight with another, with another uh, contract, like extended contract? So yeah. for example, we were talking about a fight, a proposed fight for that summer and they asked me to accept the fight, but sign a, a, another contract for like three more years or something. And I'm like, okay, why do I need to take 
that fight with a three-year agreement if my existing contract already has an extension. Yeah. It makes no sense. Why can't we just take the fight and keep that contract running? Well, like, why do I have to extend something else? Like, why do I have to sign another extension? If the contract already has an extension on its own that's applicable, then why do I need to sign something else? You know, and that was that was part of the, how it started. Um, but they never gave me an answer. They, they could never really justify why they wanted that. I asked, just give me the fight the way it is. Give me that fight the way it is without signing any additional contracts to that. Just leave it like that. And they wouldn't give me that fight as it was. They wanted me to sign another contract. So I'm like, it just doesn't make sense. Yeah. So eventually I said, you know what? We're going to go ahead and, and, and put some legal pressure on you guys. I didn't know it was going to take so long to resolve. Eventually, things worked out. I was able to, you know, break away and resume my my career. Um, at first, it might have seemed like it was, uh, you know, two and a half years of my prime career and, and really bad for someone. But I also kind of took that as time to learn the business because going through the lawsuit, you learned. I learned a lot from 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 the promotion side going through discovery and, and depositions and everything they had to open up you know their their business so I, I learned some 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 things that allowed me to have a a more prosperous career when I did come back so in 2016 2016 when I came back I started to manage myself and promote myself and I would co-promote I would negotiate with you know promoters fight by fight it allowed me to get the fights that I wanted um, fight the 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 names that I felt were, were best and really dictate, you know, where I take my career and how to guide myself and made, made also the most money, you know, so it, it worked out. Mm -hmm. It worked out for me. Did so, you ever want to fight? Well, no, go for uh, it. I said, did you ever want to, uh, did you ever end up fighting a guy you truly wanted to fight? Yeah, we, um, when I came back, I, all the fights, all the fights that I fought that I was part of were fights that I chose names that i went after um the only one that wasn't was the last one i fought that one was something separate something different but the ones that i took part of coming back from that layoff were all names that i chose to fight um because i felt those were the right fights for me for my career that would keep propelling me you know higher and higher and higher and they did they worked out it, for a moment, I was like on this roll of fighting, you know, fight after fight after fight, just winning these fights were really, you know, bringing me up, you know, leaving every, everybody else behind. And I'm just, I'm on top, you know, I was mm -hmm. on top of the game. I mean, from 2006 to 2018, you won 39 fights in a row. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a lot <laughs> of fights. Lot. Yeah, um, we, we had a good career. Yeah. It, was, it, was, it was a good, good career. Even though we had a layoff, we were able to still come back and fight really good fights, title fights. Um, winning world title fights in different weight classes and having a pretty good career. Mm -hmm. So, so I'm I'm pretty happy with with the end result yeah. and retaining the WBC lightweight yeah, we, title. We had we had yeah. uh, some, like I said, we had fights. I was first champion in 2013, featherweight title holder uh, for uh, the WBO and Ring Magazine. Then that same year, I won the 130 pound super featherweight title again for the WBO, defended that title once in 2014, had the break, came back summer of 2016, and then following right away to my next fight, uh, January of 2017, fought for the WBC lightweight title. Then I moved up to fight a 140-pound title fight um, against Lipinets. He was the IBF champion. Mm -hmm. I beat him. Then I came back down to 135 to unify those titles yeah. against Robert Easter, who had the IBF at that time. I was holding the WBC. He had the IBF. I won that fight, unified champion now. Then I jumped all the way from 135 all the way to 147 <sighs> to challenge for the welterweight title, which I, I, I lost. That was my first loss. I fought Errol Spence, who was you know, arguably the best welterweight of, of recent mm -hmm. times. And I took the loss. Okay, I I challenged myself. I tried. You know, I went up to, to 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 fight the best guy at that division, and where no one else was doing so, I did. I jumped and I jumped two divisions to get there. Like, so it was like 
for me, even though I lost, and that was my first loss, it was not really yeah. that hurtful. It was like, I'm fine with it. Let's yeah. keep moving. Let's keep going. Like, I'm, I'm okay with the loss. I accept it. Let's move on. Let's keep going forward. Like, I'm not sad about it. I'm not depressed. I'm not looking back and dwelling so much. Ah, let's keep going. Mm -hmm. So all these fights were fights that I, I chose. And even the last, uh, like I said, the last one was the only one that I didn't really have much passion for that. I was already ready to call it a night. I was ready to um, retire and just not do it again. But an opportunity came by, and I said, ah, we'll, we'll take the fight. And we did. We took it for other reasons. We took it for almost as a favor, really, to have a show, to give one of my fighters uh, at, at the gym you know, an opportunity. And he was supposed to be fighting for a title. He was going to be fighting. We were promised a title fight for him. And I said, all right, I'll take that fight just to give him an opportunity. Mm -hmm. And eventually we lost the fight, 10-round decision. I didn't care. I thought I won. It doesn't matter. It was close. Let's let's. It was close. It's, it's close. You know, I, for me, it was like, eh, that's fine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Whatever the decision says, it doesn't matter. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't erase what I have already accomplished in the past. Like, I'm, I'm good. Back to when you won the WBC belt, like, how cool is that to bring to your dad? Because I know your dad's trained a lot of guys. Trained yes. Fern Fernando Vargas. Yes. They all had, like, IBF, I, like, yeah. both bringing the WBC belt to him. Like, that's, what was that moment that's like? That's one of my uh, favorite fights. One of the most uh, memorable nights is that winning that title meant more because that's a title that my dad wanted to have earned when he was training his, his fighters, like you mentioned, Fernando Vargas and my brother Robert. They both were IBF champions. And then Fernando also had the WBA title at, at one time. My dad had wanted to earn the WBC. It's something about the WBC being also that it's it's from Mexico. The, the, the president is in Mexico, Suleiman. And some of these great champions in history have held the WBC title. So it, it's very um, desirable. It's a title that, although they're all world champions, you know, all world championship fights, with the IBF, WBA, WBO, and WBC. Something about the WBC is 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 special. Mm -hmm. At least you know for most most fight fans and fighters, and my dad included. So having the opportunity to fight for the WBC title was was great for me. Winning that fight and being able to bring that title, like my dad had always wanted, meant that much more. So that's why that makes it more special than winning some of the other titles. Um, I won the WBO title prior to that. I won that twice, um, and I was a world champion, you know, two-division world champion. I won the Ring Magazine, which is my favorite, is the Ring Magazine, um, over the other titles. My favorite has always been the Ring Magazine because I know what it represents. I know what it takes to earn that. I know that it's, it's a special uh, belt. It's not every champion can earn that. Not every champion can never fight for that. It's very limited, very, very particular on how you can earn that. So for me, it's the ring magazine. But winning that WBC title for my dad made it that much more special and, and just more memorable for me. Could you even sleep that night? We went to – we were actually here. We were here uh, – the fight was here at the MGM here oh, in no Vegas. Kidding. It was January 2017. After that, all my friends and family, they all wanted to hang out. Honestly, I, I was cool. I, didn't, I, I was like, <laughs> whatever, I'm fine. <laughs> Um, but we had, they had already arranged it so that I would come out here to, to one of the nightclubs and we did, we went out there. I made sure everybody was taken care of. I was there maybe an hour and then I, man, oh. you guys have a good night. I'm, I'm heading <laughs> out. I went, I went across the street. I went to McDonald's. I love McDonald's. <laughs> I went my to guy. McDonald's. That's my that's guy. That's my thing. That's my thing. I went to McDonald's, grabbed some, some food and take it up to my room and that's it. I, I took McDonald's home and went to bed. I, I was, I was never want to really be um not not that it's wrong or anything but most fighters winning the title you know they're gonna go celebrate and go all out and go crazy and like you said maybe not even sleep you know just from being so happy and excited you know accomplishing their dream all that for me it was never like that it was just like eh, whatever let's just go get some mcdonald's go to sleep <laughs> this is another fight. that's funny he literally eats mcdonald's what like four times a week three times a week Shh. What's what's what, what's what's the uh, the meal you get? Oh, two burgers, fries, Coke. <laughs> was that like number seven, number six? Yeah. Uh, number seven, yeah, I number think. Seven. I, I'm not See, sure. I know, I know the menu. What's your yeah. go to? <laughs> what's, yeah, what's your go to? I I do a number one, but I do no oh, cheese. 
Big oh, Mac. Oh, Big Mac. Okay. Yeah, no oh, cheese. you guys are missing out the spicy McChicken sandwiches. That's where it's at. I like them. I like yeah, them. They're that, very that, good. That, I'll get them the number one, and then I'll throw in the spicy chicken. Ones. Yeah, they're uh, good. Or the nuggets. So, <laughs> out of your fast food, McDonald's is your favorite. Oh, it's McDonald's over, over everything. McDonald's over everything. everything. Over chicken. Not even close. Like it's nothing not. else competes. McDonald's, bro. I'll tell you what. McDonald's at like eleven o'clock at night. <laughs> 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 it's unreal. It's literally <laughs> unreal. But. It's time to go to our ridiculous, um, ridiculous moments happen. I actually saw a ridiculous moment in your last fight with Sundar Martin. Yeah. The lights turned off yeah. while you were fighting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's crazy where you're just like, oh, what yeah. just happened? Um, there, there's, there's been some moments like that, some some crazy moments. Um, that did happen on my last fight. We're in the middle of, I don't know, fourth, fifth round. I forget which round. And all of a sudden, everything goes black. The whole uh, stadium went black. All the lights went out. So I just stayed at, you know, at a, at a distance. And he also stayed at a distance. None of us tried to, you know, you know, hit each other at the moment. Um, lights came back. I'm like, all right, let's cool. Go. You know, let's, let's, let's go back. Stuff like that had happened. Um, there was another, another fight that, that I was in that happened um, where we're fighting and all of a sudden the lights go out. I mean, there's, there's moments like that. Um, just shows you that, you know, nothing's perfect. Mm -hmm. uh, not everything's perfect. Uh, Sometimes it could be just somebody walking across, pulls the plug, accidentally steps over a plug or something. <laughs> you know, you just never know. Um, other, 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 other ridiculous uh, uh, moments in 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 my career. Um, let me think about something like that because walking in in in, in the uh, my my first fight. Okay, I'm about to turn pro. This is June. Of twenty of twenty oh six yeah two thousand six, I just graduated high school. I'm about to turn pro in like two weeks. Um, we happen to find a fight. It's out there in Montebello at the Quiet Canyon Golf Course. They have a ballroom. They do some shows, small yeah. club shows. All right, cool. They offered an opportunity for me to turn pro. All right, let's do it. We go there. We're weighing in. After the weigh in, my dad says, "Let me go to the." liquor store or pharmacy i forget what the store it was to buy some gatorades and just mm -hmm. you know hydrate a little bit all right cool we get the truck stolen they stole the truck they stole all my gear oh i had no cup i had no shorts i had no gear no shoes no mouthpiece no mouth nothing for my and i'm about to turn pro in a few hours because that it was day, it, happened day? To be, it was fight day. Yeah, oh. it was it was oh. the way in for for oh my, my for, for my term for my pro fight for my pro debut my weigh-in was on fight day. It was weird the way they yeah, did that's it. but so weird. You know, normally it's the day before, yeah. right? Well, for some reason, it was that day. So I weigh in in the morning, like at 10, 11 in the morning, and my fight was like at 5, 6 p.m. or whatever. But it just so happened that they stole my dad's truck. He had an Escalade, uh, and they stole the truck. But all my gear was still there. So I had to ask my brother, who was at an amateur tournament, to come down and borrow, you know, bring some some gear, bring one of the kids, you know, cups that I could borrow. I had to go to like a local uh, big five. I bought some some wrestling shoes so that I could box in. Um, we borrowed uh, shorts, amateur shorts. We borrowed, uh, what else did we borrow? Why well, he had to bring all his gear for wrapping because yeah, we, we had, had no wraps, wraps. we had none of that. Um, oh, and the mouth guard, you know, we... Normally have someone make us the mouth guards. I had to go buy like a you know one eighty nine cent type of uh, mouth guard that you boil the water. the hot water, yeah. Because yeah, oh, you, you need a you need a mouth guard in order to to compete in order to fight. So we went and we did all that just leading up to the fight, right? Mm. And uh, so that that's that's the one of the, those moments where it's like I got all these things going around. I gotta handle police police uh, report. Got to call the insurance, report the, 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 the you know, the vehicle. Um, I'm handling a bunch of other stuff. I got to go buy those shoes. I got to go do that mouth guard. I got to wait for my brother, call my brother, bring shorts, bring a cup. You know, we're all doing all this stuff, and I'm fighting, like, that same thing <laughs> like, within a couple hours, you know, like two hours difference or whatever. That's crazy. Um, but that's that's how I turned pro. Oh. Made, you got paid 900 bucks for the fight, but... What they stole from me was actually worth more than that. <laughs> so oh. I ended up kind of losing money on my for a fight. Did you I guys ever know. find it or anything? They, no? they they found the truck a couple of days later. I think it was like on a Monday or something, that, Tuesday they found it. They called us up. We went back. 
It was sitting on on, on bricks. It was sitting on bricks. They stole the, the wheels. wheels. Yeah. They stole the all all the gear. They was was gone. They stole all the gear. They stole the back seat. <laughs> um, they didn't mess with the back with seat. anything else. Like they didn't mess with the engine or anything. But they did steal the wheels, and uh, I, I think that's that's really why they stole it. It was for the wheels. My dad it had some some nice, nice wheels, wheels on, on it. it. So they stole the wheels. They they took all the gear that I had. Um, I don't know whatever happened to that. My robe, you know, everything that I had, even like warm up gloves and mitts that we had, it's all gone. Shorts, t shirts that we were gonna give away, all gone. Pictures, bunch of stacks. We had bought, made, uh, I think it was like 500 pictures that we were gonna be handing out, Jeez. all gone. That's so, crazy. That's, that's a, that's and boxing that. gloves aren't cheap that's at all. No, no. It's, it's and I can't stuff. imagine what like the shorts are and oh, stuff. Oh, my, my whole oh. outfit. It was, oh. it, was, it was shorts and robe, everything. Um, just my, my outfit itself was like 1500 bucks, 1600 bucks. Just oh my, my outfit gosh. itself. So I got paid 900 bucks, but but I lost, you know, almost maybe 2500 bucks oh of, of gear. Yeah, that was more. all on eBay like an hour later. <laughs> <laughs> if, Literally. If, if, if they had kept it. It probably would be worth yeah, some, some money what, with it, my career now. What box? What type of boxing gloves was it? Like Grant? Everlast? I I had I had some warm up gloves that were winning, small little warm up okay. glove that were there. We had some mitts, some some small winning mitts, also for warm ups. Um, and like I said my custom gear that that was the shorts and the robe. That was like just that was like sixteen hundred bucks for that. Uh, oh um, my god! So yeah, we we had some. St- oh, my mouth guard was like two hundred bucks. The mouth guard. That's uh, tough. Um, shoes i had some 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 boxing shoes so yeah it, you know probably 20 2500 bucks worth of gear oh and t-shirts like i said yeah we were they were passing out and so yeah that's we were gonna give uh, away a bunch of stuff but i only got paid 900 for that fight <laughs> <laughs> that's funny that's <laughs> definitely yeah uh, oh are you gone and i was gonna say what a debut to be yeah. to turn pro <laughs> <Seriously>. <laughs> I, I, sh- I shouldn't have taken that fight <laughs> that's funny. um but yeah, it's definitely a ridiculous burn moment. I, don't, I would never expect that's that. Like that's like fight day. That's, that's that's like going to a golf tournament because golf clubs are expensive. Oh my gosh, yeah. like thirty five hundred dollars yeah. for like the best good, of the best. And that's like going to a tournament and stolen. And then you have to go use the then, rhino club. Yes. And then you're using like other people's stuff, and it's yeah. like not Just the same. Doesn't right. feel the I same. I had to wear. I had to. I had to borrow one of the other fighters' uh, amateur cups for for, the, for my fight. <laughs> oh. You know, so it's not, that's not, that's, <laughs> yeah, not, that's not clean, clean. That's not pleasant. That's something you want to do. Um, but there's nothing else I could do. There's nothing, there's no other store. It's not like you can just go and buy, you know, this kind of equipment. Um, so we had to borrow stuff. That's wow. literally a burn moment. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's definitely a, a ridiculous burn moment, but we're going to move into N now to complete burn. And it's kind of like two parts. It's like now and next. So are there any burn moments that you're going through now? You recently retired. Um, super into cars and yeah. you got your Garcia promotions. So is there any burn moments that you're really trying to get through right now? Well, I mean, we, we experience things, you know, on a daily. Um, I just recently retired or officially announced it, you know, this last year, but even my last fight, my last fight was October of 2021. As soon as the bell, the last bell rang, I told Robert, my brother, Hey, that's it. I'm never doing this again. All right, that's it. We're done. I didn't care for the decision. Like I said, I, I had already made up my mind. I was never going to do it again. Um, and I kept telling people that I was done, but no one really paid attention or no one really thought I was going to be serious about retiring till last year in the summer that they started really, you know, throwing the news out. And I said, yeah, I'm done. Like, I, I'll wow. confirm that. I'm, I've been telling you guys. <laughs> I didn't ever made a big post about it. I never had an interview throwing it out there. I never did a video, you know, on my social media. I didn't feel like I needed to do any, any of that. But I would sh- tell people, yeah, I would share. Yeah, I'm, I'm not fighting. I don't plan on fighting no more. Wow. So they finally ran some some notes, some stories about it. And now everybody saw that, yeah, I'm retired. Um, so everybody, the question, so what's next? What are you doing next? What do you want to do? What's, what are you going to do? Well, I feel like I'm taking a big break from working. I dedicated 20 years of my of my life to the sport where I didn't have time for myself. I gave a lot of time to my fans, to the business, to promoters, to everybody else except for me and my family and the kids. In fact, I lost a lot of time because of boxing, even though boxing gave me everything that I have right now, it took 
took away a lot of time, a lot of special moments, a lot of special activities um, from holidays, birthdays, um, you know, anniversaries, whatever. It, it took a lot of time. I'm trying to kind of get that back. How? By spending time with the family, with the friends, creating memories. Um, I wasn't even there when my daughter was born. On her actual birthday, I was out in a fight. I, I had to go fight in Texas. It was one of my first earlier fights. And that's the, the day that my daughter, you know, was, was born. So those are special moments that I was not there. And some birthdays. I'm in training camp. I'm, in, I'm on diet. I'm on holidays, you know, things like that. So I'm like, I'm taking a big break. Um, I want to make sure I can get, you know, catching up with some of that lost time because mm -hmm. you'll never be able to get that back. But at least you can try to create some 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 good memories, some good stories, some good moments to to appreciate what, what we have. And so that's really what I've been doing um, as far as business. Yeah, we got the promotions. We you know, we, we have fun with that. We're not doing it for the business. I'm doing it to help the fighters get some fights and, you know, get some exposure and whatever. Um, not really for the money. There's not a lot of money in the small shows. There's, there's not a lot. If you break even, you're winning. That's that's really how it is with the smaller shows. But at least you might start building the brand and build the company. Eventually, maybe one day we can actually expand and do something much bigger. But for the moment, I'm just kind of relaxing, taking some time. Mm -hmm. um, I've gotten involved in other things. You mentioned the cars. We do like, I do like taking my cars to the track. Some of the cars that are, you know, track ready i'll take them out there have some fun uh, i'll take some of my friends i always want to bring a couple of friends so that they can experience you know what it's like to be on a car like that and take it out the track and go 160 miles an hour 170 miles an hour and turn you know and just they don't have, they'll never ever have that experience unless they ride with someone like myself or else just watch it on TV, but yeah. you really can't do that. I'm going to have to try that one time, though. If you guys are down, I'm so down. down. Let's, let's oh, do I'm it. down. Are you a good driver, though? <laughs> Come on, bro. <laughs> that didn't make, yeah, that yeah. Didn't question. Well, but your, your Lambo is so sick. I have oh, to thanks, say that. Thanks. Like, that, that custom wrap you have, it. I don't know if you've seen it, but it's like, the, it's white, white and it fades to black. black. Yeah, yeah. It's so sick. Yeah, it I think so I've seen it. So seen it. So Lambo is your car? I'm a Lambo guy, yeah. I've had two other ones. Um... Right now, I have the uh, Lambo SV, the Aventador SV. Mm -hmm. I kept that one. I have a McLaren 650. Mm -hmm. um, I also have my Dodge Viper Ooh. ACR. So it's it's, it's wow. a track ready um, Viper ACR. GTSR is the official line yeah, name of it. Um, those are the three track cars that I that I have. Okay, I've been taking the the McLaren more lately. It's they, it's funny, they all drive a little different. You know, the McLaren is a rear-wheel drive. Mm -hmm. The Lambo is all-wheel drive. Um, the Viper is rear-wheel drive stick shift, so it, it drives, you yeah. got to be really able to, to know what you're doing. But every car drives differently, and also depending on what track you're in. Smaller tracks, the McLaren does it. The McLaren will do better than every other car. But on a big track, like... Uh, Auto Club Speedway in Fontana. Yeah, that's right out here, right? Yeah, I, I go out there and, and the Viper does best because all the aerodynamic, all the aero that it has, it really grounds the car and you, it allows you to go faster over turns. And that one, that one's it's pretty sick. That, one, that one's badass. You should get into but, professional driving now. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't know if I think that's too late NASCAR? for me. NASCAR? Uh, Would you do it? NASCAR or F1? I think, I think if I, if I, um, Wanted to do any type of real racing like that, I'd go into road course, kind of like 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 yeah. F one road course, over NASCAR, just because it's more fun for me to actually be able to turn and you it there's it takes a lot to understand what it what, what racing is like. You got to be very focused. You got to know exactly what you're doing. You got to feel the car. You got to read the road. You got to read the car right. Um, and you also got to watch out for, you know, other drivers. So there's a lot more that goes to it um, than just hitting the gas. Yeah. Uh, some people think, oh, you just hit the gas and let's go. No. There's a lot more. It's an art. Fortunately, like I've, I've had enough fun with it, but not enough to be considering, you know, professional career or actual racing. I, I, don't, I don't see myself doing that. Plus, it's, it's also very expensive uh, to do it on your own. That's why everybody has, like, teams with, with sponsors and everything. Cause it's it's it 
It's expensive stuff. I mean, I was looking, I was watching the Daytona 500, and the guy who won had like all these sponsors on him and just <laughs> in his little clothes. Yeah. And it's we, just we like, might have Whoa. to get, we might have to get a burn factory car. Yeah, that'd be that'd pretty be cool. Sweet. That'd be cool. We'd have to get Mikey to help us design it because we'll know all <laughs> no, the right I specs. can drive. I can drive. I'll you drive. Can drive it. Oh, yeah. I'll yeah. Drive for you. He's the driver. What, what am He's I not, doing? I'm not. I'm not that. I'm not that good. Like maybe like level like oh professional. But in the in the groups that I go with, um, I'm actually in in a pretty high group. Pretty um, well, the highest group of the the, the class that we go with, mm-hmm. and uh, we get a lot of uh, former drivers there, pro- former professional drivers. And uh, everybody's like top level. Um, there's a few times that I've actually placed, you know, um, the, the fastest time. Auto Club Speedway in Fontana. It's a 2.8 mile course, and I uh, my fastest lap time was a minute 44 seconds. Mm. And at that that moment, that was the fastest for the for the for the for the class. So I've done some pretty. I've done, I'm not bad. I'm not bad. That's Dang. so sick. Hey, you'll have fun. All right, I, we'll, we'll have to go. <laughs> we'll, have we'll have to, to take it up, but. Mikey, you just you spelt burn in your life. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Yes, we are, thank you. We are super so blessed to have you to be sitting in that chair. But tell the audience where they can find you, Instagram, Garcia Promotions, yeah. everything. So, so so we got, you know, we got my social media and Instagram at uh Team Mikey Garcia. That's my 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 social media, my Instagram. I don't do any other other platforms, um, just Instagram. And I am the one doing I am active on it. I may not post as much on actual like hard posts, but I do go on the lives. I'll, I will go on, on on the stories, and I have fun with it. I like to have fun. So like you mentioned, you saw the me tasing the guys. <laughs> yeah, you know, we have fun. So that's what I post. You know, mm-hmm. the the daily you know life with me. You know, on my on my life story or on the stories. Hard post I'll leave for for other 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 reasons. But um, yeah, man, that's that's my handle. Uh, Team Mikey Garcia for Instagram. Um, we do have Garcia Promotions. That's another another page. You can always follow that through me. Um, but I mean, I like to have fun. I like to be interact with my fans. I like to be accessible. And mm-hmm. I think I think that's what people are drawn to the most. That I am accessible. I do reach out. You know, I do say hi. Um, we do you know shows like like this. We do a panel. Last week I was doing another panel out there in in LA. So I mean, we we're accessible. I'm mm-hmm. down to earth. So anybody that has any questions, yeah, send a message. Here we go. Boom. That's, Here we go. that's cool. That's People cool. like to see that. Yeah. Team Mikey Garcia, go follow him. But Mikey, as a gift for coming on the podcast, you will get this black label edition burn factory oh, appreciate hoodie. It. Thank you. With the hat as a gift. I got some gifts for you too. Oh, oh okay. I got some gifts for you guys. Watch. Okay. Come on, over here, Chucho. Should I be uh, nervous? Uh, duh, 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 duh. Nah, 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 nah. <laughs> it's gonna be a snake. <laughs> nothing to be nervous about. Is it gonna be a snake? No, no, I'm no. joking. <laughs> we, we we just want to make sure you guys are are also rocking some some of the merch, some of the Ooh, gear. Oh, okay. Thank you, bro. Yes, sir. And you only can get the black one if you're a guest on the show. Oh, really? So, yeah. yeah. Oh, nice. Only, yeah. Special. O- only guests get those. Only guests. All right. Ooh. Ooh. Okay. So, okay. so, so you guys got some hats, camera. some shirts. Oh, oh thank you so much. Thank you. So- you can get oh, that awesome. that glove there rock, too. Yeah. Rock rock you, guys, right you guys can rock those hats yes, and sir. some of the oh, shirts. The headphones off. How's it yeah. look? Looks good. Looks good? Yeah. Ooh. Ooh, fits good. And you guys, I can, like you guys it. can have some of the shirts uh, also and the glove. You got a signed glove there that I autographed oh, glove. Thank, thank you, you so you much. much. You know, you guys can display that. or For yeah, sure. For, for sure. sure. Thank for you, sure. guys. Appreciate it, man. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mikey. Yeah, thank you, Mikey. And that will do it for another episode of the Burn Factory Podcast. Like always, please visit my foundation at priestjamesfoundation.org. Again, priestjamesfoundation.org to understand why this is called the Burn Factory. See you guys for the next episode.